little bit of the magic smoke. What we have here is a barn find 1916 manufacturer 98 Mauser. And I'm going to tell you what, it is unmolested. And this is how you want to find them if you can find them. This has not been sporterized. It has not been cut up. It has not had a lot of things done to it. What I want to point out in the process of conserving this thing is a couple of key things to just take a look at. There is no way in a YouTube video I can tell you whether or not your Mauser is safe to shoot or how to make it safe to shoot. What I can tell you is certain things that should be red flags to tell you not to fire it and what to go talk to a competent gunsmith about. So in this particular episode, there's a couple of things I want to scope in on. The rear sight on this is unmodified. This is Longa's rear sight. Colonel Longa, um, I think he was a colonel, came up with this analog computer to put the ballistics curve on. I want to talk about the correct way to make the tools, take this thing apart, lubricate it, put it back together again, and not have pieces of it flying all over the shop. The third lock and log. This is a misunderstood piece. And why, if this log is actually doing anything, you should not shoot the gun. The shroud, safety, cocking piece, sear, trigger in a relationship. Not understood by very many people and how to tell whether or not this is going to let you down. We don't want an off safe fire here. If the stock cracks here, why the problem is up here. Deep dive. This is a moldable cigar evolution. Down a rabbit hole. Step one, I've modified my can of, of uh, angel piss here with that straw. This is a straight up straw off a can of WD-40, can of brake cleaner. And you cut the nose off of it here and it really makes precision application. I'm going to tell you, I'm not sponsored by anyone. I just use this stuff because it works. So I like going around and getting every screw, every pin, every everything on this thing because we are not going to re-blue this gun. So I'm not worried about polluting it with a little bit of oil. All we're going to do is just go around and oil everything with some kind of penetrating oil. Let me make one point here. Everyone's going to start yelling about automatic transmission fluid and acetone. I have no data on whether or not that's good, bad, or ugly, but I do know it's hygroscopic. So when you get in there with it, it's going to start sucking up water. So in my opinion, if you're breaking stuff loose with acetone ATF, you better break those screws loose muito pronto and get, the, get that stuff off and get it oiled. Anyway, that's just my opinion. All the oil has been in. You got to make sure you get the oil up here because this is really rusted. Now, just as this band doesn't want to slide across rust, that bullet does not want to slide down a barrel that's got rust in it. We're going to talk about rust and dry down lubricants as a bore obstruction later. So I'm going to slide this piece of leather up underneath here and push in on the lock and log, and the leather keeps me from dinging the bottom of the stock. Now, you can go out there and say, yeah, the bottom of this stock has been beat up before by a hell of a lot more people than me. True, but not by me. All right, there we go. So that's the front band that came off. And we can actually see the original finish up underneath here. So this is telling me that this is going to be a pretty sexy rifle when we get this thing done, because there's actually something there to save. We'll come back now and we'll do the, do the next one back. Okay, I'm gonna squeeze that in with my thumb and just give this a little bit of light massage here and see if we're not hung up. Okay, there we go. I had to push the band in a little bit more. I'm just trying to not ding the bottom of the stock up. I'm not hitting this very hard. Yeah, that's gonna have to come in a little bit harder. So what we're doing now, it's crawling up on me. So I'm going to need to come in and get right there. So I'm going to get a punch. 
all right and I'm just gonna lightly tick on this here it goes you saw it start to rotate and we can start the old crab routine here okay this thing's in there tight I'll tell you what it's um that's wedged so we got a lot of rust jacking going on here we'll just work with it we'll just work with it and work that off and then a little bit more work that off and i think the wood swelled a little bit there's no screw here this is just a straight band lock it's not been tightened down and we're just walking it off like this all right, I got to get a, a brass punch. You can see now the hand guard's starting to slide on us, right? And the handguard is actually starting to slide forward, so that's kind of fighting me a little bit. Because this is oxide jacked like crazy. Okay. Okay. Clamp that in there like that. Now let me see if I can maneuver this without the forend sliding, without the handguard. There we go. I'm not really swinging this hammer. I'm just kind of, we're not beating this up. this maybe the rest of the way off sucker was in there tight so what happens is the rust the rust takes up more space than the iron did and it it's called oxide jacking and it'll actually make the band smaller because the band the band got bigger which means the space got smaller so now we can take this off we haven't beat it up we haven't killed it but boy there's some dirt in there Okay, and then we can get this thing the rest of the way down the fore end and off. And hang on, once I get it off, I'll show you. Wow, wow, we all right. So, the inside of this has got a lot of rust on it, you see. So, that's what we were trying to avoid it's rust and it's mud. There's actually mud. So, what this is telling me is this gun has not been apart in a month of Sundays. Um, we're going to put just a touch, touch of oil on it here. And what I want to show you is underneath all that mud, there is a beautiful spot of finish. That's what the gun looked like when it was new. And that's why when you want to like look at something or read a number, don't scrub all of this outside stuff off or else you take off the original bluing and you'll screw it up. There's a unit number on this. I'm guessing that's what that is. Um, that was written on the other side. There's a uh, an imperial mark on this, which I'm guessing is the Kaiser's mark. I don't know all this. I'm not the historian. Moving around back, <clears throat> we'll bust this lock screw loose. Now these lock screws on some of these guns do not have to come all the way out, and this one doesn't. And when we get this all the way out, I'll show you. <clears throat> there is a indent cut in this lock screw. It does not have to come all the way out. There's like a half moon in there that's going to allow this to come around. Switching screwdrivers now. Kind of an awkward angle for me, but I need you guys to see this, not me. You see, and the penetrating oil had gone all the way down the shaft here. 
but this is that little half moon cut that that that, that lock screw rotates into so all you got to do is roll it up roll it up to there and out it comes we can then take this screw out just because it's what we're doing but ordinarily in disassembly you wouldn't have to do that okay and that's going to come all the way out We'll talk about that in a little bit but there's that nick i'm talking about that allows the head of that screw that's how it locks it so you roll up like that that's the lock position roll this in there and roll that around and it comes right out same for the front one so you make the moons match That comes right out. And when these things blow up, they'll, they'll rust in right here. They'll rust into that mortise right up on top. Very seldom have I ever seen the shafts rust or the threads. It's always the heads that give you the problem. All right, we got to switch camera angles here because the next thing I got to do is bang the butt of this thing on a bench and let the, the mass of the action drop it out for us. So rather than try to pry this up out of the stock, we're going to use the mass of the action against itself. Roll it over on a soft surface, put your hand underneath it to capture it, and just bump it on the surface, and it will come apart all by itself. So I'm going to set the stock off to one side and we're going to take a look at what we've got up underneath the stock line. So this is the part of the muzzle that's exposed and we can see all this red rust here and there's some three-dimensional uh, accretions on the outside of it. But I don't think there's a lot of deep pitting here. It doesn't feel like it. This rust went on slow. It took a hundred years to put this mung on it. We'll talk about what the heck's going on inside the muzzle later. Something's going to have to be done in this to be able to shoot it. But it's when we get up underneath here, we take a look at that smooth blue oxide. Look at that. Let me get that lit right. Let me light that right. Here we go. Look at that. That was the color the gun was when we started out life right here. And I'm hoping we can bring a lot of that back. And the big one here is we don't want to scrub it. So I'm looking underneath the stock line here. Let me get it relit. And as we roll under that umbra, we can see right where it was. But I'm not sure a lot of that isn't just dirt. That might be mung. We might have got lucky with this one. Sometimes you'll see a lot of rust. But here's the mother load for what the original finish looked like down under here. Look at that. I mean, that's gorgeous. This sleeve right here that holds the long of a zero on is silver soldered on. So if we have to use any heat to dynamite this loose, you got to be very careful. You don't get this up over about 300 degrees because then the silver, the solder will get loose and it, all kinds of issues. Just don't do that if you can get away with it. But it's also important to note that if you need to take this barrel off this action, gunsmiths, don't, you got to get this out of the way first. It's just something you got to do. So match mark it, take it off, clean it up, put it back on later. All right, we're looking under here. Nothing under the stock line. Look at this. This thing is gorgeous. We got some red rust here. This is case hardened, but not case colored. So that's why the difference between the colors of the action and the color of the barrel. So this is case hardened. Case colors are a decorative thing. Case hardening is necessary when you don't have the steels yet to really get the wear you're looking for. This thing looks completely unmolested. The trigger pack looks unmolested. It's original. Um, it's, it's, it's nice. Yeah, this is definitely worthy of salvation. Okay, so the bottom metal comes out. Bottom metal's not bad. There's more mud on this gun than there is dirt. We're really looking out here. This is, this is the gun you want to find, really. This is the one you want to find. Now, I see a little bit of dry rot going on in here. We'll see how deep that goes. But no oil penetration inside the stock. The, uh, the ferrules are still here. Not bad. Yeah, you see all this, how it's, how it's like white? This thing, this thing got its one dip of oil at the uh, factory and has never been dipped. It's hard to show this, but there's a little bit. It looks like mold in here, those little spots. 
that looks like mold. We can deal with that. And then any oil intrusion in here was in here because I put it in there when I was oiling everything down. Um, okay, the stock looks pretty good. The, the butt plate's another matter. The butt plate has, those screws have been hurt. We're gonna hit those with another load of angel piss and come after those a little bit later. Um, because those have been those have been hurt pretty good whenever they're you're drilling or you ground the butt so if you look you can see all right I've had Bruno Bruno do a refocus you can see the three-dimensional the three-dimensional um, oxidation on his butt plate so I'm wondering what we're gonna find when we get up underneath it I reheat it I'm gonna let these heads soak a little bit more so we'll go after the nose cap uh, first we're going to talk about how to get this thing off. There's a pin through here. And people forget that this pin's in here. And they try to drive this entire thing off. And it rips. It'll, it'll blow the end grain right in here. And it'll pop it all off as one piece. We see a lot of that. Um, so this just needs to get mounted up here in the vise. In fact, I'm going to go vertical here. Again, we're not cracking on this really hard. We just want to get it moving. There it goes, it started moving there. Sometimes they're mushroomed, the heads are mushroomed a little bit, but this one didn't fight me. In fact, this will probably come out pretty easy. Put my thumb right there to, I know you can't see it, but I'm trying to keep them from shooting it across the room. So that's the pin that holds that in. And then once that's off, this should slide off the front. But that piece of wood from there to there is all it's holding the entire front of that gun together. So you gotta be real careful you don't abuse it. Not a lot of rust up inside, um, right there. Not a lot of rust up inside, we're good. Slid right off, but man, this thing is dry. And it's got this like pulpy, gritty crap all over my hands. All right, let's go after the butt plate screws because this is gonna require a little more fall. There's a lot of garbage in this screw slot. I'm just going to go through and knock this garbage out of the screw slot. And you don't want to try to stick a screwdriver blade down in it until you've got it pretty well cleaned out. There we go. So yeah, there's a lot of schmutz down in that, in that slot there. And what I'm really concerned about is that the rust has glued the screw to the outside of this. So we'll sort through here and find an appropriate screwdriver tip. And I have not pre-selected one. Yeah, actually, that's going to be about right. All right, we're back. And I found an appropriate uh, screwdriver blade that doesn't quite cover the entire width because I know that this is a... Uh, a screw that has a, a re recessed head in it. So we don't want the screwdriver tip to gouge. So I'm just going to see if we're going to get, oh my God, did we ever get lucky. Okay, I got lucky on that one and it didn't rust itself in, but we pre-oiled. We gave it about 45 minutes to an hour to act. Um, Pre-oiling your jobs is a good idea. Okay, look at that lathe made screw. That's, that's silly. Look at that. Crazy. We see all this rust up here right underneath the rim. That's what I was afraid was going to glue this in. All right. Same deal on the other screw. And we'll just, I'm going to roll this vise around a little bit. We do the same deal. I'm going to knock all this beat in dirt out of here. Again, no, I'm not using a lot of force here. I'm just tapping on stuff. I'm not, you don't have to be, that's why I like when the screw slips over, there's no drag marks because I'm really not pushing down on it by much, which is part of why it's running away from me. Bear in mind, we checked before we began this saga and this is not Lawrence of Arabia's Mauser. <sighs> okay. Oh, we 
Yeah, that's a lot of fun squeaking out from underneath that. Man, I got lucky twice. Cause look at the inside of that. Look at look at that. How orange that is. We just got lucky. Okay. It's better to be lucky than good. And the perception of competence is intoxicating to my customers. Yeah, look at that. That's what I mean by oxide jacket right there. Okay. So we're gonna watch that, and this should be a lot of fun. Yeah, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. There's a lot of schmutz rolling down there, but not that bad. All right, we're good. I've got the bolt out of this gun. And when you take the bolt out, you wanna have the flag standing straight up. This is the disassembly position that allows you to depress this plunger and just roll this off the back. This comes out as, as a cassette. Now you might notice, this isn't the Mauser we're working on. This is a Mauser that has the takedown ferrule in it. And it's amazing to me the number of people that I show this little trick to that don't know what this gizmo does. So you stick this thing in here like this, and you pull down on the shroud like that, and you rotate this piece, and it will come off. And then, the entire firing pin train unstacks in your hand. And to put it back together again, you throw the spring back down on it. This has actually got a flat spot on it right here, so it has to go back in a certain way. And then you can pull down and toss the cocking piece back on, rotate it around, bang, it's back together again. And that's what that little appliance does. I just want to show you guys that. The other thing is, I knew the firing pin had been snapped off on this thing, and this was somebody's attempt to neuter it. I really wish people wouldn't do that, but they do. So we have a redundant firing pin. <laughs> New manufacturer, yeah. So we've got a way to come back up. These are available. They're not prohibitively expensive. And actually, you'll want a new one because it's made out of better steel. It doesn't have pits in it and all that other happy crap you don't want to have to deal with. On military weapons, these band locks right here will kick your butt because there's a pin that goes through the stock right here that lifts this whole thing out. Actually, the pin, yeah, that's where the pin is. So we're going to want to drive it, but if this is oxide jacked, it'll hook up. If you try to just get up underneath this and pry it out, you'll bend it and snap it off. So there's a couple of ways to look, there's a couple of ways to look at this. We're going to roll this up because I want to hit down on it. So hang on a minute. There's a pin right here. Okay. There's a pinhole there. There's a pinhole there. And yeah, I did put a little bit of a croil on it. So let me get the light around here because I'm going to show you that I put my finger underneath it like that so I can feel it. And I think we're going to have to light it this way. Yeah, we'll light it like this. There we go. So I put my finger underneath there and I'm just lightly tapping down on it. I've had these things rust in here so bad that I've had to actually blow the stock out in order to get them apart. But that little bit of tapping, you see, has, let me get behind it here. That little bit of tapping has lifted this clear, but it hasn't lifted that clear. So that's why we haven't uh, you know, turned loose on it yet. We've got to go ahead and get the back of this out of the hole. We gotta get the back of that up out of the hole here. And okay, so the band lock goes all the way down in back here and we may have to go back in again. Yep, there it went, we got lucky and popped out. But what you didn't wanna do is bend this thing out this way and snap it off right here. See, and you can see all the rust. There's a lot of rust on this thing and the pin is corroded and it's it'll fight you coming out you see so you got to take these out you just got to be smart about how the heck you do it the other one comes out the same way we'll get these in the pot with the rest of the parts the last thing i'm not going to screw with is this stock ferrule um, we're going to just clean it up lightly because this is a high torque peened over evolution right here I'll show you how to take it out, but we're not going to because we don't have to. Everything is dry. Nothing is impacted. 
we have no cracks back here. But if this lets go and starts to slide to the rear, all that recoil goes to the uh, goes to your shoulder through the, the walls of the magazine. That has not failed on this gun, so there are no cracks back here. But we've got it apart, and I'm going to tell you, my hands have this gritty nastiness on them. So I'm going to conserve all this. I've got other videos on how to conserve stuff. Same thing, we're going to boil it in straight, Berkeley County dihydrogen monoxide for about an hour or two and wash it all down and take it the rest of the way apart. And then I'm going to talk about the things that I want to talk about in this gun. We'll do it after it's cleaned up. When we did the 1888 commission rifles wood, we were outside with a little bit of soapy water and a green. Okay. So that episode is going to have the full effect. But the wood just gets just a light greening. You're not getting weird with this, but man, are you pulling the dirt. So that's all we're doing is getting finger oils, getting things off the outside of this. And then um, hand me the, what, the white rag. Thank you. That mud right there is what's coming off the outside of this rag. Okay, that's what's coming off the outside of the stock. Now we'll have to go back and you know wash it down with, with clean water. But as you can see here, let me get this rolled around like this. See how that's almost a tan and that's still a dark brown right there. So that's what we've done. All we're gonna do is wash this stock down. Now, there are, this is washing this out here. Let me move this over there. There are a lot of dents in this stock. That dent, we're gonna to wanna to steam up. These dents down here, right there. There's a dent right there, you see? There's a dent right there. Oh, wait a minute. Those aren't dents, those are stock cartouches. So you gotta be careful when you're lifting dents in a stock like this, that you don't lift the stock cartouches off of it. There's one right there underneath my finger. You see it right there. Don't lift these stock cartouches. That's all I'm trying to tell you. Um, if you're doing Grandpa Humpty Fratz's hunting rifle, sometimes you'll see, like, you know, kill marks on it. You got to be careful about that. Now, something I am going to go in and take off is I'm going to take this unit of ID disc off, and we're going to clean that up so we can read what that said, because that's that's uh, important, and it actually has data written on it, but we can't we can't really see that. So that's what I'm doing while while the metal is converting we've got all the metal off the bench it's in the back boiling and we're in here scrubbing it down all right very good now this is going to require a coat of linseed oil when we get done but that's all it had on it in the beginning there is a purpose-built tool for removing this recoil ferrule i'm not going to take this out there's a bit of a, of, of a peen on the outside of that where it's just been beat up over the years. And this stock is dry and clean and there's no oil and there's no reason to take this out. If you have to take this out, you'll know if it's rusted, if it's, if it's wobbly in the hole, and then you've got a whole other problem with not being able to contain the recoil. So I'm not going to do it, but just know that there is a tool for this. And uh, it comes in a lot of these gunsmithing screwdriver sets. If you've actually got to go after that, you can go after it. All right. Something I want to show you here. We uh, cleaned, we cleaned the stock off. This was a white t-shirt. When I started working on this stock, it was white shop rag. And this is how much dirt we pulled off with a little bit of soap and a little bit of scrubbing action without taking anything else off the surface. I'm going to come back in with a little bit of Danish oil here, and we're just going to wipe this stock down with some Danish oil. Hang on. Danish oil is linseed oil dissolved in stoddard solvent. Look it up. This is not a coat. This is an application. We are just going to get this sucker wet and let it drink because it has not had nourishment in a long time. I'm going to go inside and outside with this stuff. Danish oil will penetrate the wood and then it will oxidize and polymerize and it will get hard inside the wood, but it will protect the wood. We're just going to slab it on 
and let it drink. Okay. It's not a urethane. It does not set up on the surface. It sets up in the wood. And God knows this girl needed it. Okay. You can go right over existing metal with it. Get up inside the magwell. Ordinarily, when these things were done originally, they were just dipped. I mean, it was grabbing Achilles and lowering him into the Ajax, man. So... We did this to the 1888 commission rifle also, and we talked about a lot of that there on the commission rifle. I took that unit identification cartouche out. I don't know if it said anything on it. We couldn't read it, but we'll find out. It may have been a replacement one. The flipping disc is pushing uh, almost 3 16 of an inch thick. Okay. Don't let this stuff dry on a stock. You'll get this thick. It's like a, a like a mung almost. It'll 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 gel up on you. Let it penetrate for 10 to 15 minutes and then come back and wipe it off. And we'll just get all this end grain here. And we got it all. So we've got this thing good and soaked. And you can see it's still sucking it. Now that little bit of mold that little bit of mold scrub right off that we saw before up at the front. But uh, some vinegar or maybe a little bit of Clorox, just a bit. Problem with Clorox is if you get it on the outside of the stock, it'll bleach it. The vinegar won't bleach it. I would run with the vinegar. It makes your hands smell, but whatever. It'll, it'll kill it. It's a little bit of a... Um, uh, it's, it's acidic, so it'll, it'll just kill it, knock it back, and you'll be golden. All right, so there it is. And we'll just go ahead and, and, and we know that that's in there. So what will happen is we'll set this off to one side. And then in about 10 or 15 minutes, we'll just come back and we'll wipe it off. And that's what it'll look like right there. And that's going back now. That's starting to look like a, a, a rifle. It's got a little bit of a sheen on it. When it dries back, we can kick it. I'm not going to steam any of the dents on this gun. I've come to the conclusion that we're going to leave this thing as we found it. We're just going to stop it from dying and that is the entire purpose of this exercise oh yeah and don't forget to do the hand guard we've converted off all that mud and all that rust look at that look at that thing and i don't i don't even know how to adequately show you how gorgeous this thing was when it was brand new this is why the 1950s collectors were screaming at everybody to not just come in and wire wheel everything down to the white. Okay, we roll over the top here. Now let's talk about let's talk about this long of his ear, and we'll work on it at kind of an angle like this, just so that it's easier for y'all to see it. There's not much to this sight. This doesn't come off. There is a screw here. Don't. What that screw is doing is just kind of holding your index while you're uh, soldering it in. And if you look in here, you can actually see the solder down in this pit down here where the whole thing has been tinned, slid over, and the whole thing's a sleeve back to here. You can polish this if you want to. You can polish this with uh, like, a, like an 800 grit crocus cloth and just take the silver back off the top. I'm going to leave it alone. It's got numbers on both sides. Um, same deal with the, with the traverse. Um, there's a set of uh, pointers that stick down on this underneath here that point at all these numbers. It's a beautiful sight. And it's not as complex as you might think it would be. Um, a lot of guys that have this sight, uh, I'm reading on forums where they get their, they kind of get their butts kicked by this thing. You see there's a, an indent here. So when the spring pushes this up, that locks into that groove, and when you push in with your finger, it allows it, right? So if you've got one on either side of this, when you push in, it unlocks and it slides. And then when you let it go, it comes back to the outside and it locks again. My fingers were in the way here, but it'll make a little bit more sense in just a second. As you can see, the rust converted off this part beautifully. There's no, uh, we didn't augment the, uh, the bluing on it or anything. We're just going to stick a little bit of of uh, Lucas in here. Again, I'm not sponsored by these guys. I just use their stuff because it works really, really well. 
there's a spring tunnel in here and a spring goes in the tunnel there and a spring goes in a tunnel there okay and then you got to have the hook facing down so it becomes pretty obvious and I'll line it up for you here in just a second if the hook is facing down that has to go in that way so that's going to go on and that spring is pretty aggressive that spring is pretty damn aggressive so then this one goes in this way and they face each other you see so then there's a spring in there and then that will just push in now I'm bending that one spring there so I don't want to do too much of that hang on here we go there you go that's the idea right there okay so then so you've got to get this compressed so that the springs don't bend and you've got it down now so the locks are out of the way and then it just slides on now I know it said it just slides on but it just slides on and once you get it in they're captured see but that's what you're trying to do you've got to get it so that the dogs are lined up so that they grab the springs did not bend over and I just there is just no really good way to show you that but that's how it's supposed to work right and that slides there and then there's the pointers down on the bottom that are pointing at the numbers and when you run it all the way up the very top number is at the very top that's how you know it's on the right way okay now we've got the slider part of this this is a is a analog computer with a ballistics curve milled into it as a cam as you slide the slider up this will actually move up and bring your rear sight up to a position that corresponds to where the round might have hit on a day in Berlin when the sights were, were calibrated. But I'll tell you something, this thing's got a 400 meter battle zero on it. Seven, six, five, it just does, doesn't quite come down to five right there. And I'm gonna tell you at 400 meters, I can stand in front of a white automobile wearing a green jumper with a red shirt and I'm hard to pick out. So here I am standing in front of a white car about 400 meters in front of the muzzle. You got to be kidding me. Yeah, I'm just going to go smoke this cigar and, well, let this bus cut off our view. A little bit more assembly lube. that plugs in there okay and then this is just going to be a simple tappity tap tap and there's nothing holding this in but raw friction all right okay maybe it's I'll flare it out a little bit yeah, I need that. Just go in until it's level. Um, hand me the blue one, will you? Okay, in order to shove this that last little bit, just kind of right there. No, I'm not hitting a hammer with a hammer. This is just a punch with a handle on it. Okay, now you take an old screwdriver bit and you cut the teeth in it so that they fit right in there. This is what a moto tool is good for in the shop. A Dremel is great for making stuff like this. But if you don't have this tool, you will just mung this screw up. That's all you'll do. This just goes in here. Let me get my fingers out of the way. Okay, that one's gonna screw in there. This one's gonna screw up in here. And we're gonna grab the track with it, right? So I'll roll this up here and make it a little bit more obvious. We're going to grab the track with it. This will mount in a screwdriver and allow us clean and easy turning. Now, these threads are, you got to make sure you don't trap it. These threads are tight and they're tight for a reason. 
because they don't want this screw coming out. You don't have to kill it. Just touch down and cinch it. See, and now it's grabbing it. And this is just one side grabbing it. And this allows us, as we slide this back and forth over the numbers, to access the ballistic cam, to set the rear sight, to pivot the barrel down, to cause the round to travel over the earth in such a way that it impacts at 1,600 meters. <laughs> Outstanding. That log right there, that's a safety log. And the back end of this is designed that if the two main primary logs break and all of this gas venting paraphernalia here fails and this bolt fails and it comes to the rear, it should be intercepted. Let me get my hand out of the way. There it is right there. There's the locking surface right here. And this locking surface should not touch the back end of this bolt or if it does very lightly this does no work just just know that this lug is here and we have actually seen a mauser where these logs were lapped down so that this would be in contact don't do that so when you look at this it shouldn't be shiny at all and it's hard to photograph because it's made out of steel but that's pretty much dull that has never done any work nor should it that's all I got to say about the third log. Just if this log has been messed with, just just stop and go talk to a gunsmith. So this is the aforementioned firing pin, cocking piece, safety tab, sear, trigger overlap that I was talking about in the beginning. And there's a bugaboo here. Because what this safety is supposed to do is cam this piece backwards so it requires a little bit of effort to turn a mauser safety on when you roll this over and we'll get it all put back together again in the gun and i'll show it to you when we get it in the gun here but there are some camming surfaces on the back of this you see them right yeah right there where's the light there it is there's a couple of camming surfaces here and here that are designed to grab the top of this cocking piece and shove it backwards. Now here's the problem. This is hard to move, so I'm gonna go in with a stone and do gunsmithing. Don't do that. Never, ever, ever, ever touch this cocking piece with the exception of perhaps cleaning up the odd burr or getting a little bit of detritus off of it. When this is on, this cocks back. The trigger can then be pulled. And when it's left up, the cocking piece is turned back to the firing position. It sits, I mean, the uh, safety uh, tab is turned back to the firing position. The cocking piece sits back down on the safety. Now, here's the problem. If you make this easy and you can turn the safety on and it doesn't move this, you pull the trigger and that goes tick up against the front end there. And what happens when we take the safety off? Firing pin goes forward and the gun goes off. Blows a hole in your foot, blows a hole in your overhead. Just don't do that. So that's one of the big deals we're going to look for. We're going to put the gun back together again. I'll show you what this looks like when it's all loaded up on a spring tension. There's something else that a lot that happens up inside this thing. Is that people want to cut this ledge off right here. They don't like the fact that you have to cam this sear down a long way. Well, let's remember now that this gun was designed to be operated by tired cold scared witless conscripts that can't even read and i'm not bagging on the soldier i'm just saying that's what you get in the middle of world war one <clears throat> all right so this is designed it has two camming surfaces on the top of it there's a bump back here and there's a bump up here all right and if these have been ground off or adulterated get a new trigger just don't do it if this ledge has been cut because somebody's trying to put that there clean trigger pull on it, this is not the gun. You get a clean there trigger pull on, it isn't. This angle has to be cut at an absolute 90 degree perpendicularity to a line drawn through the line of thrust here, okay? When this is cammed down in first position, it comes most of the way down, and then in second position, the leverage is poor, and you can just pop it out of the way. We'll demonstrate in the gun. But the point is, when this is coming down, this cocking piece should be moving backwards 
ever so imperceptibly. The act of pulling the trigger on a Mauser should imperceptibly cock the gun. And what that means is these angles are forcing this into engagement. This trigger should hold weight without the trigger spring in it. It should hold weight without it. You wouldn't want to shoot it that way, but that spring adds a bunch of weight to the trigger that needs to be there in order to control it. But all that spring is really doing is returning all of this to position. We're going to put it back in the gun. I'm going to show you what this looks like. But just know that if it fails the test that we're about to do in the gun, do not put a live round in this thing, please. All right, let's do a little bit of cleanup here. I want to talk about a couple of things. There is a double, this comes down and there's a definite resistance point right here. And then it comes to the rest of the way out. And those are those two lobes on that can. If the trigger's been ground or this thing's been ground, just get another one. Just, just, just humor me and do that. There was a gentleman out in California asked me about that. Couldn't understand why things weren't working the right way. We replaced the, the sear and everything worked. So if it's been ground on, it's been ground on. All right, something else I want to show you. This firing pin here has a contour to it. And what that contour does, you, know, you don't want to see that wiped or messed up. This is your out of battery interlock, all right? So you can see how the firing pin is sticking out the end there, and now it's not, right? So there is a way, when the, when the bolt goes in, let me roll this up. When the bolt goes in, the bolt has to be rolled all the way down. This thing has got to have its locking lugs engaged before the firing pin is allowed to hit the primer. You don't want that. That's an out of battery interlock. You do not want that safety feature defeated. Okay. As this gun was developed, we finally wind up. You start out at the 91 with this little vestal flag about the size of my fingernail. Here we wind up with this entire shroud that's designed to keep gas out of your face if you blow a primer, if it gets by these two monster ventilation holes here. If you do that and it pressurizes through the firing pin hole, it's going to pressurize the mag well. It's going to blow the magazine out into your hand. But what would you rather do? Be picking this bolt out of your eyeball or be picking some wood shivers out of your hand? I'm going to pick the hand part. When we were taking that, um, that lock, that barrel bend lock out, I told you to be real careful about moving this. It had already been broken. If you go back and look, you'll see that this thing had been kicked down inside the hole like that. Or I think maybe it was mounted like that. And we pushed that up. That had already been broken. That was broken a long time ago. This, I've got a guy that can weld this. You can't weld this, trust me. And I can't weld this, but I got a guy that can. I'll go get another band lock off one, off one of my private guns and we'll throw it in so we have a stand of fighting chance of shooting this thing. But I, I don't know if we're there yet. All right, I'm going to go ahead and put the, put the gun back together again, and uh, we'll kind of, uh, kind of go from there. The thing I want to show you is this. You see where that groove runs out? Where that groove runs out, that sits inside. you got to get those two up in there. And once you get them up in there like that, you can press up on this. That kicks up over the top. You roll it around into the slot and the ejectors on the gun. And that was probably clear as mud, but that's what it is. If you ever have an opportunity to not take that locking ring out of this bolt, don't take it out. Because in order to get it out, you've got to spread it out enough that you're going to put it in peril and you will snap the back of it, trust me. And they're very hard to find, okay? So that's all the little stuff. Um, and one final thing. This is a screw that's been fully conserved and we have entire videos on how to conserve stuff. This screw has been conserved and um, carded. This one was conserved and not carded, but you can see this was that butt plate screw that had um, all, the, all the yak up the upper butt plate screw. This one here hasn't been touched. It's hard to tell the difference, but you really get a good look at it when you look at this. Um, this is the, um, the lower um, the swivel screw, swivel plate. This side over here has been wire wheeled, or not wire wheeled, uh, carted. And this side is uncarted. So you can see we take that hard oxide that's present here, 
convert it into a loose oxide by boiling it in water for a while and then whisk it off. And I'm going to tell you what, this thing cleaned up nice. Look at that. This is just a little bit of used motor oil on top of it. No bluing, no pushing. There was a beautiful gun hiding underneath all that mess. Now, some pieces of it, not so much. This butt plate is hurting and it probably is going to have to get ground. If I want to get this raised stuff here, that's three dimensional. I don't know. But if you beat on this with a hammer, it'll turn orange. It'll start, see right there? That'll start turning orange because I'm popping those shankers. And this is three times through the water vat. Yeah, this is three times through the water vat when I hit it. it it's got a ways to go yet. But this is the only piece on the whole gun that had rust that was that deep. And that was three passes, an actual wire wheel, and I still had a bang on it and a hammer. So this is going to need a little more help. But it's not under the stock line. It's when the action starts looking like that that you got to start asking yourself some questions. The rest of the gun just came out gorgeous. Okay, I have it assembled here, and it's off safe, okay? So when you put it on safe, we're going to cock it again, come to the rear, and set it down, the cocking pieces to the rear. When I put the safety on, and I'm going to do this, I'm going to have to reach around here. I want you to watch the cocking piece as the safety comes on. See how the cocking piece came to the rear? The cocking piece is now off the sear. It's not doing anything. And that's what we want. And when we take it back off safe, we want to see the cocking piece come forward and sit down on the sear. Okay? We do not want it to go off when we flip the safety off. The safety, you cannot put it on when it's not cocked, right? Come back out and grab it. Then the other thing we're checking for to make sure that the, the cocking piece or the sear have not been adulterated, I want you to watch the cocking piece. See it moving ever so imperceptibly backwards. As we're pulling the trigger, we are actually cocking the mainspring ever so slightly. We get up on this resistance point, and we can sit there and hold that. And then when it's time for the gun to go off, just give it a little snick and it drops. There's something to be said for these two-stage military triggers. When you got cold fingers, you haven't eaten in two days, and we're right back to that old scared out of your gourd thing. But that's what I'm talking about. We want to see a little bit of rearward, a little bit of rearward movement, and we definitely want to see rearward movement in an unsafe position. That will tell you that you stand a fighting chance with this trigger of not hurting somebody something or having a, a, a fire. Then the other deal Okay. He's beating on a historically significant gun. Yeah, but if this historically significant gun goes off with this It'll go off if you ground the butt. So you better make damn sure that this thing holds full cock under some external loading. Now, it's a soft hammer, but you better hit it a little bit. Make sure.
right, I'd said before that this butt plate had the rush anchors on it. I went ahead and pounded them down with the hammer um, and then really aggressively wire wheeled it. And I know we don't want to wire wheel stuff, but I did. I turned part of it white. I went back in with a hot water balloon solution and went ahead and blued it. I did not buff it down. I did not buff it all the way down. So you can still see that it's got, you know, you can still, there's some pits there. But more importantly, it doesn't look like it's been messed with. And that's the trick. It's still got the acceptance mark on it. Not bad. But that's not the real problem with this gun. The real problem with this gun, and why we're not going to shoot it, and everybody wants me to shoot it in this episode, but I got a lot more work to do, is that. The real problem is that rust right there. Those couple of shankers. And I'm going to tell you, that rust goes down about that far inside the bore. It's only about that far down, and then the rifling is pristine the rest of the way down. So that's, you cannot shoot that out. Rust is a bore obstruction. Cosmoline is a bore obstruction. A thick layer of oil is a bore obstruction. Oversized projectiles, the, the list never ends here. This, even if I scrub this out, is going to be slightly over diameter. And what's going to have to happen, and I'm just going to exaggerate here, that's going to have to get counterboarded. That, I'm going to board a muzzle out about that far and put a crown down inside of this. And that's not going to happen today. I'm out of daylight. I can't shoot it. It's just something you got to look at. Now, should this have been the very first thing I should have done on this gun? Yes. However, I wanted to show you guys all the other things with a Mauser. So let me pull this thing up and show you what it looked like when we're all done with it. Because it turned out pretty nice. And this gun will come back from the dead. You cannot shoot that or you will put a, put a ring around it right here and the whole gun is gone. Now, he's going to ruin that priceless collectible. I did not make the decision to do this. All I'm going to do is get us out of it. But this required a setup in the lathe and the lathe was being used today for a, a, a much bigger paying job and it's got a setup on it because it's got to be done in a big lathe. And I just didn't have the equipment in the shop right now. I'll go around it and come back to it. Last thing I'll tell you is we did put it back together again because I stole a forward barrel lock out of another one. We'll get the uh, other barrel lock, the one that was broken. You can see it back here laying on the bench. The one that was broken, we'll get it, but we got this. You cannot shoot this gun without these barrel locks on it or else these bands will just come flying off the front end of it. Well, it cleaned up really nice. The bluing cleaned up nice. The gun cleaned up really well. And with the exception of that issue out at the muzzle, I would have to say that this was a pretty good save. We left the stock unmolested. All we did was take the dirt off the top of it. All the cartouches are in one piece. All of the markings. We got the long of his ear. It's not bad. We proved that the fire control system works, that the safety works that the, uh, the, the sear cocking piece angle is correct. Um, I've even pulled a bore brush down this thing and the bore is okay. Um, it's uh, just right up to there. So there it is, guys. And I gotta tell you, another successful beat, I think. And as always, it's been a pleasure to have done some of this with you guys and just show you some things about a 98.